not the guest speaker for today, but it is my honor and privilege to introduce to you Dr. John Tompkins, who is bringing us our guest lecture today. Uh, so I got to know Dr. Tompkins way back in when we still had the old Spence building and when you used to teach physics in the physics lab. So I want to say we go back, what, 15 years maybe? 12 to 15 years. Um, so, and he is one of the most fun person to be around, truly. The kindest gentleman, was always talking to us, and we had a lot of conversations when we taught evening classes, and we had all this time where we were waiting for our class. But Dr. Tompkins earned his B, uh, Bachelor's of Science in Physics from University of Florida, and then he earned his PhD in Physics from Clemson University. Um, he loves playing tennis, golf, and billiards, and any more to add to this. Pickleball now. Pickleball, Let's go. pickleball. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. John Tompkins. <laughs> oh, great. Yeah. Yes. Uh, dear loving Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your grace, your faithfulness to us. And Lord, just for the way you sustain the universe, and then you also sustain each of us in our lives. Lord, I thank you for bringing us this far into the semester. It's only by your grace, Lord, and by your mercy alone. Thank you, Lord, for giving us the ability to appreciate, uh, to be in awe of your glorious and wonderful creation. Lord, as we listen to this talk today, I pray in a very special way for Dr. Tompkins as he uh, brings to our attention, your wonderful creation and universe. Lord, I pray for him and a blessing over him and his family as he travels back to his hometown. Lord, I pray for each of us here in this room that you would continue to be with us, give us wisdom and discernment and encourage us, Lord, and be with us through this weekend. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you. Thank you for that, Thank you for that kind intro. We have gotten back to work. So good afternoon students and some faculty and friends and my daughter's here with her granddaughter that's why i came down here she my granddaughter is a junior in high school she's here for preview days mm -hmm. she's here uh, looking for a good school where she can find a good husband like her mother did, <laughs> her mother did about 20 years ago she's embarrassed now so and and i asked i asked my pastor uh, from willow baptist which is a church i attended when i lived here i moved to georgia about two years ago and that's church I attend when I come back. And if you're looking for a good church home, he's a great teacher of the Bible. He's a wonderful man. I wanted to give him this opportunity to kind of get back on me for any times I nodded off during his sermons. You know, he, can, he can get one of those back. But anyway, I want to. Uh, so, Dr. Uh, Professor Holman asked me to give a talk, and so I was. I taught astronomy. I was asked to teach astronomy back in 2014. Uh, and I found out about this place called LIGO. Anybody familiar with LIGO? Nobody. Oh my God. Okay. Yeah, of course. So I found, and it got very interesting, and so I thought I'd talk about that. And I told him I could talk 10 or 15 minutes about LIGO. He said, no, I need a half hour. So, <laughs> so you guys get to hear about an astronomy intro too, a little astronomy primer. So when I was asked to teach astronomy about uh, 14 years ago, uh, I'm sorry, 2014, um, I have never had an astronomy class. I'm not one of these guys that goes out and looks at the stars. And so I was a little concerned, but I haven't got a PhD in physics. You know, I know everything, like Sheldon you know. Uh, so I knew about nuclear fusion. I know how stars work. This would be a piece of cake. Boy, was I wrong. I had a lot to learn. So, and I apologize, and I hope you guys will be easy with me because I wrote this about five weeks ago. I sent it to Professor Allman, and I haven't looked at it since. So, and my memory, you know, you can tell by my hair that I'm a little older and the memory's going, but anyway. So, how do we know how hot a star is? How do we know how much energy they emit? How do we know how far away? If you look at the sky, can you tell which star is farther away than another? They all pretty much look like points of light. You can see maybe little variations in color, very slight variations in color, frankly. Little variations in, 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 in uh, how bright they look to you. But the ancient Greeks saw the same sky. In fact, they saw it a whole lot better than we do because they didn't have all the light pollution that we've got. 
And they saw those stars. They thought they were basically all the same distance. They were on this gigantic sphere out there. <laughs> uh, so how far away are they? It's, it's very hard to tell. How big are they? Because again, they all look like points of light. They all look the same size, basically. It's, it's hard to tell. How massive are they? My goodness, how in the world can you tell how massive a star is? Uh, how old are they? So there's a lot of things that we talk about in astronomy that we get basically just from the light coming from the stars. I mean, it's amazing how we can analyze the light and get all of that information. What are they composed of? Do they have silicon in them? Do they have oxygen in them? Do they have hydrogen? What, do, what, what, what makes a star up? How do we know that the energy produced in the sun, so this is how ignorant I was. I, I knew about nuclear fusion, but I thought it happened all throughout the star. But it doesn't. It only happens in the inner 25% of the star, you know, what's called core. So that's where all the energy is produced. When that energy is produced, when that interaction, when that nuclear fusion takes place, then it releases radiation in the form of electromagnetic radiation, which in turn is actually gamma rays. It takes it over 100,000 years to get out to the surface of the sun. Once it reaches the surface of the sun, it takes about eight minutes to get to Earth. So going that little bit of distance, well, it's, you know, 700,000 miles, but going that little bit of distance takes it over, they say uh, approximately 170,000 years for it to escape before it gets out uh, and leaves the cigar and, and comes to Earth. So how do we know how hot they are? Well, this confused me a little bit. It might confuse you a little bit because when you go to a faucet, which one's the hot and which one's the cold? Color, color wise. The red. the red faucet's hot, right? And the blue faucet's cold. Stars are just the opposite. If you see a blue star, it's hotter than a reddish star. So this is a picture of what constellation? It probably says Orion. Right. <laughs> yeah, right. So Here's Betelgeuse, notice it's a little reddish. And here's Rigel, notice it's bluish. Betelgeuse is about 3,500 degrees Kelvin. And actually, any, yeah, there's some, yeah, you're all physics guys. So when you say Kelvin, have, have y'all have done heat, right? Heat and temperature. When you say Kelvin, you really don't say degree, do you? You just say, I can't get over the habit of saying degrees. You know, so forgive me for that. So 3,500 Kelvin. Whereas Rigel is about 10,000 Kelvin. So uh, a, a big difference in temperature. And you can't tell that completely just from the color, but just by seeing one is blue and one is red, you know that there is a difference in temperature. So color of the star tells us a little bit about how hot it is. Also the spectrum of the star. We'll talk about spectrum in just a few minutes. All right, so how much energy does a star emit? So when we talk about the energy that a star emits, we, we use the word luminosity. So luminosity means the entire spectrum of energy because stars not only emit visible light that we can see, but they emit other kind, kinds of light as well. They emit infrared, they emit ultraviolet, sometimes they emit x-rays and stuff like that. And so all of that combined is what we call um, the luminosity of the star. So I, I used to show a video when I taught astronomy, and it was this uh, British astronomer, Brian Clark, I believe was his name. And he does this thing where he goes out in the desert, he wants to see uh, you know, how much energy the sun emits. He takes a pail of water, an umbrella, and a thermometer. And he goes out in the desert, got the umbrella over the pail of water, and then he removes the umbrella, puts the thermometer, well, he puts the thermometer in water first, finds out that it's the temperature of the ambient air around it. Okay, so let's say it's 85 degrees or whatever. Removes the umbrella. Now what's happening? The sun is adding energy to that water. And you probably guys, you guys probably did an experiment like this in lab where you added energy and found out how much energy is added over a period of time, whatever. And, and, and since you know the heat capacity of water, you can calculate how much heat is added to a certain mass of water and so on and so forth. So that's what he does. He takes pail water, umbrella, thermometer, goes out and measures how much heat the sun is giving to this area right here. So you can find out. Um, okay, 
So you can uh, find out what the energy per square meter is. And so that's the energy right here in front of him. But if you think about it, that same amount of energy is in this square meter here, in this square meter here, and all across the earth and all in a circle, I mean a sphere, all the same distance, you know, the radius of the orbit of the earth from the sun. That's approximately 150 uh, million kilometers that uh, the earth is from the sun. And what's the uh, area of the surface of a sphere? Four pi r squared, four pi r squared. So you take that and you multiply times that energy per square meter that he got here, which is about 1300 watts. And you multiply that by four pi, well, that's pretty small numbers. But then r, r is 150 million meter, uh, kilometers. So that's 150 billion meters. You square that, you got a pretty big number. The sun's luminosity is, this is where you have to forgive me if my memory is not too good, 3.6 times 10 to the 26 joules per second, approximately. If you check Google, hopefully I'm in the ballpark. I'm sure about the 10 to the 26, I'm, and I'm pretty sure about the three, I'm not sure about the six, but anyway. So you can just, with a pail of water and an umbrella and a thermometer, you can figure out what the energy output of the sun is. For a star, it's a little bit more difficult because they don't heat up pails of water. You know, it's hard to isolate that. But you can use a light meter and a telescope and you can determine what we see, how much the brightness is, how much energy do we receive from that star per square meter. Then we gotta know how far away from that star is. Okay, so that's the next key to the thing. How do we find out how far away it is? Oh yeah. Recognize. So we use something called parallax. So you can you can observe parallax right there in your seat. Put your finger up in front of your nose. Close one of your eyes. Close your right eye. Alright? So your left eye is open, you're seeing something over here. Now close your I forgot which eye is closed. Close the other eye. And you should see something over in this direction. Or maybe I went the wrong way. I don't know, because I'm backwards. <laughs> I'm looking at you guys. On the left side there. And so that is parallax. Parallax is when you're looking at an object and you see a different background based upon your position. Okay? So how do we do that for a star? Because if you use your eyes, you know, that and, and do that to a star, you're really not gonna see a lot of difference. Uh, you know, in fact the ancient Greeks, they were pretty smart dudes and they couldn't see any parallax, they couldn't measure any parallax at all. So to them, all of the stars were the same distance. That that was that was one of the keys to what what was the theory about where the Earth was a long time ago? <laughs> Center of the universe. Yeah, and that was one of the reasons is because they didn't see any change in the in the different you know different distances for the stars. So they thought they were all going around us. But here's parallax. So what you do, you look at a star in January when the Earth's over here or December, whichever. So here in January, you see this background star. Here in July, you see this background star. Then you measure this angle, okay? So that's called the parallax, parallax angle. Anybody familiar with the term parsec? Science fiction, right? They use that a lot of times. They talk about, you know, we're three parsecs from landing or whatever, something like that. So that's what that stands for, parallax arc second. So what is an arc second? So you take a circle. I'm not going to draw because I draw terrible. So if you take a circle and then you look at an individual angle, what's the smallest angle you think of measuring in a circle? What's it called? How many? There's 360 of them in a circle. Degrees, right? So if you if you think about a circle, maybe a two feet around, make 360 little marks. Each one of those will represent a degree of angle. They'll subtend one degree of angle going around that circle. Now you take that degree and divide it into 60 pieces. That's an arc minute. You take one of those arc minutes. Now think of this, this is 1 60th of a degree. You take one of those arc minutes and divide that into 60 pieces 
that's an arc second. So it's an incredibly small angle, okay? But they can actually measure here on Earth using Earth-based telescopes now, they can measure down to like a hundredth of an arc second, which is a good thing because the nearest star to us is less than one arc second away, okay? And the smaller the angle, the farther it is away, all right? Because if you look at this, if I bring this star down here, notice now I'm looking at a bigger angle. So the closer it is to you, the bigger angle it is. So the further away you go, the smaller the angle that you're having to measure in terms of parallax. Uh, but the Europeans have sent out a, uh, I never know what to call these things, um, a spacecraft, a telescope, something, I don't know, to measure parallax of over 400,000 stars because we're only able to measure, like I say, 0.01 arc seconds here on Earth. So how far does that give you? So how far is a parsec? So one parsec, which would be an angle here of one arc second, is 3.26 light years, okay? So it's over three light years, but the nearest star to us is Alpha Centauri, actually Proxima Centauri, and it's 4. I don't know, three, I think, 4.3 light years away. So it's less than one, one arc second. Um, and so, uh, so 0 0.01, one hundredth of an arc second, would be 100 times 3.26, which I can, I can do the math on that, 326 light years. Guess how big the, the uh, galaxy is, the Milky Way? It's 100,000 light years across, 100,000. We can, and one arc second is only 326 light years. You can't even get the Beetlejuice in 326 light years. It's about 500 light years away. So uh, it, it's incredible measurement that they are able to make. Uh, and so that's how we can find the distance to a star. Once we know the distance, once we know the apparent brightness, then we can calculate the luminosity of basically any star. All right, how do we know how big a star is? All right, so by using these other techniques, we can calculate the luminosity of a star. So we know how much energy output it is, all right? We also can calculate the temperature based on the color of the spectrum, that kind of stuff. So we know the temperature, we know how much energy it's put out. Well, there's a law called the Stefan Boltzmann law that says the energy output is equal to this constant sigma times the temperature to the fourth power, all right? So now we can calculate the energy output of the star, all right? Because we know the temperature and we know that little sigma. Also, you know that the luminosity is the energy per square meter times four pi r squared. So we know L now, we know E, we can calculate R. So we can calculate the size of a star. So, you know, NASA and all of these science uh, teams have done calculations and they've just got databases of lots and lots of information about how big this star is and that star, how hot it is, what its luminosity is. Um, and all that sort of stuff. And so back in, ooh, I don't know historically when this occurred, but there's two gentlemen, Hertzsprung and Russell, that basically both came up with the same idea. Scientists, in order to kind of understand systems and everything, scientists do like to make graphs. You, you, get, you, you get, need to graph something, right? Uh, and you can understand patterns then and where things are going. You can make predictions and that sort of thing. And so both Hertzsprung and Russell decided, why don't we plot something of, uh, that has to do with stars? And so what they came up with, this, oh, that's a terrible picture. Uh, they came up with uh, plotting luminosity against surface temperature. Okay, so the luminosity, the energy output of the star versus the, super, uh, the uh, surface temperature of the star. And they got a graph that looks something like this. Although, hopefully it's a lot clearer than this one. So, what they found is this thing here, all of these stars along this line, and that line is called uh, the main sequence. And they did something weird too. If you notice this graph, I know you can't read it. I can't even read it up here. It starts with big numbers here in terms of temperature, 30,000. I don't even know what that says, 10 or 15,000, and so on and so forth. So it starts big and goes small. Most graphs I've ever done, you start small and go big. But these guys, I don't know, one was uh, British. So, you know, that was probably right back. Um, and then you do the luminosity. And you notice the number one here, 
kind of see that. And then 10 to the minus one, 10 to the minus two. So this is logarithmic scale. But the one means in terms of the luminosity of the sun. So all of these stars are measured, their luminosity is in, it measured in terms of the luminosity of the sun. So a star right here, of course, is basically a star, the equivalent star to the sun. A star up here is a star that puts out a hundred times, I'm sorry, uh, a thousand times the energy of our sun. A star down here is a star that puts out one thousand of the energy of our sun. The thing that all of those stars have in common is they are all taking hydrogen nuclei and those are being slammed together forming helium. So they're all fueled by nuclear fusion in the form of hydrogen going into helium. But what other kind of nuclear fusion could occur? Well, once you get helium, once the star is all helium, if the star is big enough, then those uh, nuclei will start you know, banging together and they will take three of those. Oh, we don't have a, we don't have a you know, chemistry thing. So you can form oxygen. No, not oxygen, form carbon. So you put three helium nuclei together and, and you get carbon, you know, carbon 12. Uh, and that sort of thing. So, but all of these stars are doing hydrogen fusion. These guys up here have gone through that stage, and these stars are very big. If you have high luminosity, normally it's going to mean a, a large, especially if it's cold. So this is a red star. That's called a red supergiant. That's what Betelgeuse is right now. If you look, if you see anything in the news, if you see anything about astronomy, and that's one thing I started doing when I when I started teaching the course, since I didn't know any astronomy. I, I got this daily thing called Earth Sky News, and it kind of gave me, you know, indications of where the stars are tonight, where they are related to the moon, and any kind of information that came out on astronomy. And it, it was kind of interesting. These guys here are basically all dead stars that will be like our sun. When our sun dies, it will become one of these, the white dwarf. Uh, so bigger stars become these supergiants and whatnot. They become hot. Uh, balls of flame and that, that sort of thing. And they're, they're fusing helium, possibly, you know, oxygen and stuff like that. So from the hertzberg russell diagram, you can actually get ideas of, and I don't know if this particular picture showed it, but you can get an idea that as we go up this way, the mass is getting larger and larger. For any of those stars that are still fusing hydrogen, if they're very bright, if they're very luminous, very hot, then those are pretty massive stars. So you can get an idea of the mass uh, from that uh, HR diagram. And in fact, mass is one of the things I forgot to put a slide on here, and uh, I meant to update my, but I forgot. So how do we know the mass of a star? Uh, you guys that did uh, physics, so last semester you talked about Newton's law of gravity, right? Did y'all do something about orbits? Did you learn about? So there's a fairly easy relationship, well, fairly easy, you know. Um, oh, yeah. Is this a good marker? <laughs> or is that a permanent marker? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, you know, I'm a physics teacher. Here. I have to show one formula. You got a marker? So, what's Newton's law of gravity? <laughs> Come on, dude. What y'all are in physics? F equals what? Capital G. <laughs> Over R squared. Oh, this is a different Good job, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, what's Newton's second law? This is the next one. Second law. Okay. Thank you. Wait, I said that the first time. Okay. So, what M are we talking about here? So, let's talk about the Earth and the Sun. So, the is the Sun going around the Earth, or is the Earth going around the Sun? Yeah, we think of it as the Earth going around the Sun. If the Earth was a whole lot bigger, like say Jupiter, and, and uh, even Jupiter, when you when you think about it, because the sun contains 99.85% of the entire mass of the solar system. So basically the solar system is the sun 
Yeah, so this is so small in comparison. So uh, they, they go around the, you know, the center of mass of the pair, but the center of mass for anything in the solar system is inside the sun, okay? It's, it's actually inside the sun. So this would actually be the mass of the Earth here, and so those are actually gonna cancel out, and you get G times the mass of the sun divided by the distance squared to the Earth is equal to A. We got circular motion here. The Earth's going around the sun in a circle. What is the acceleration? What's it called? When you have circular motion, what kind of acceleration is it? Centripetal. Centripetal, thank you. Do you know the formula for centripetal acceleration? V squared over R. I think it's V squared over R. There's one that didn't even get help from the teacher. V squared over R. So one of those R's can go away. Now remember that distance is the distance from the uh, sun to the earth. How would we know what V is? What's the, in, 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 in truth, <laughs> he's a good one. In truth, uh, the orbit of the earth around the sun is not a circle, okay? It's an ellipse. But it's really, really, really close to a circle. I think it's like 92 million miles to 93 million miles. So it's only like 3% difference from being a, couple, uh, a perfect circle. So we, in our approximation, we can, we can approximate that. So we're trying to find the mass of the sun. Remember that? That's the, that's the program here. So V is pretty easy to find. V is simply, what's the definition of velocity? It's distance over time, right? Okay, so well, how do we figure that? Okay, so the distance, it's going around a circle. So if we think about a whole year, how far does it go? Two, two pi r? So, it goes two pi r, distance around the circle. Now, don't forget that's squared. Okay, so distance over time, so what's the time? 365 and 40 days, and then you gotta convert that seconds. It's a big hoo-ha, and I'm not gonna worry about that. So 365 days converted to seconds. Anyway, we can get all of those numbers, right? It's very easy. So I, I know what r is, that's 150 million uh, kilometers. I know what 365, you know, actually, the, uh, I'm going to try to stay away from tangents. I, I love tangents, but I'm going to try to stay away from them. So we know what G is. Y'all remember who found, who, who calculated G, who measured G? A guy named, I can't believe I remember this, Cavendish. Cavendish measured G. And it was a big deal because the people of the time didn't know how massive the earth was. This was going to tell them the mass of the Earth. I mean, they were super pumped about that. Uh, so anyway, what what time is it, man? I, One thirty. Okay, I, I need to move on. <laughs> <laughs> so here's the spectrum of our sun. Notice all these little lines, all these little dark lines in here. What do those represent? Those, so the sun's putting out a continuous spectrum of light, okay? So it's putting out all colors, but it's got these little dark lines in it. What's, what's going on there? Well, there's stuff in the outer atmosphere around the sun, oxygen, nitrogen, helium. Actually, that's how they discovered helium. Helium was not found on Earth. It was found in the spectrum of the sun. That's why it's called helium, because helios sun. Uh, and so they look at all these lines, and these are the spectral lines of the various elements, or possibly compounds. So that's how they can determine what the sun's made out of. And they call hydrogen and helium, those, those are gases. Those, those comprise 99% of all stars, all right? Everything else, nitrogen, silicon, oxygen, whatever, they call those metals, even though to chemists they're not metals, but to astronomers, they are. They're just any junk that's in the star that's, you know, not really helping it produce energy. And so this tells you everything that's in the sun. Every, and if you do this for another star, it tells you everything that's in the star. So they can find out what makes up all of those stars out there. It's, uh, again, from light. So everything we know about stars up until that point was about light. So I was asked to teach in 2014, and I started reading this Earth Sky News, and then in 2016, I saw this article about LIGO. Oh, that's cool. What's LIGO? And it turns out there's a LIGO not too terribly far from us in Louisiana, in Lex uh, Livingston, Louisiana. 
uh, not too far from Baton Rouge. And so we found out that the third Saturday of the month, you can go to LIGO and you can take a tour, which my wife thought was pretty cool. It gives us an excuse to, I knew my phone would embarrass me. Gives us an excuse to go to <coughs> go over to Louisiana and eat some Cajun food, you know, uh, jambalaya and a crossfish pie and a bowl of gumbo. So we went there, I had some of that, it was good. Uh, we went to LIGO, here's LIGO. <clears throat> See these arms? Let's go two and a half miles. Two and a half miles. What did they need an arm? Two and a half. What did they do with that arm? They evacuate a tube and they shoot a laser beam down. Two and a half miles. It's crazy. Here's the center. Okay. I don't even see the road we came in on. This may be, I think this is in Louisiana, uh, but they had another one in Hanford, Washington. Okay. So there's two LIGOs and there's actually a Virgo which does the same thing uh, in Europe somewhere. So what does LIGO stand for? LIGO stands for Laser Interferometer Gravity Wave Observatory. So we've been looking at light, now we're going to look at gravity waves somehow. Who in the world thought of looking at gravity waves? Who even thought of gravity waves? All right. Well, a guy by the name of Einstein kind of came up with the concept in 1915 with the concept of general relativity. So gravity was seen as kind of uh, not a force, but a geometrical effect that mass has on space-time, all right? And in, in the late 60s and early 70s, and I've got this next slide in the wrong, I told you to put this in the wrong place, so let me bypass this. In the late 60s and early 70s, a guy by the name of Kip Thorne and a couple other guys, uh, well, I'm forgetting one of them is Beaver. All right, I'll have to wait till the end to find out what the answer is. Who is here? <laughs> so, anyway, anybody recognize Kip Thorne's name? Anybody watch the movie? Anybody watch the movie Interstellar? Did you really? Did you like it? Yeah. I hated it. I had to go see it because it was scientific, you know. It was, and this guy, uh, did they win a Grammy for that? He was the technical advisor on that movie. So in the late 60s and early 70s, he and a few other guys got together and they said, you know, gravity waves exist. How can we see them? And they came up with this concept of laser interferometry. Okay, so you guys know what? Have y'all y'all done your inter, interference stuff, right? Chapter twenty-eight, I think it is. Yeah, I'm on there. All right, so um, you've done that sort of stuff, and so they're doing interference. But guess what? The rays are not visible light; they're infrared light. I think the the wavelength is a thousand fifty nanometers. Um, and so they, they started thinking about it in the late 60s, early 70s. In 1990, 20 years later, the National Science Board approved LIGO construction. In 91, Congress appropriated the funding. In 92, Washington and Livingston, Louisiana was chosen. Uh, and the thing, construction phase, oversaw construction, 94 to 98. So we're like 30 years out from the initial concept, all right? And then the installation of missing LIGO, the initial interferometer in 1999 to 2002, and the first few searches 2002 to 2005. Well, they went on searching till about 2009. Never saw the first thing. Can you imagine? Kip Thorne conceived this idea in 1968. Now it's 40 years later. They've had, had funding, they've had people working, going to work day after day. Come home, hey dear, how was your day? Well, you know, we polished the lenses, we, didn't, we swept the floor, we didn't get any results. For 10, for what, eight years, nine years, something like that? Well, uh, 2002 to 2009. So in 2010, they decided, well, we, we think that there's some engineering things we need to change. And so they started doing a second phase, an upgrade. All right, so in 2010, LIGO shut down for advanced enhancements. The upgrades were done from 2011 to 2014. So we got another four years 
invested in this project that we've had no results from. And I don't know how much money they put in. Uh, and then in 2014, Kip Thorne, like, Kip Thorne was a technical advisor for the Sci-Fi movie Interstellar. Um, and then in 2000, okay, I, I should have put this here. Bring it to that, that's there. So what happened to enable this to happen? So in 2015, so I said I learned about LIGO in 2016, because that's when they reported their first results of actually seeing gravitational waves. So I believe it was on September the 14th of 2015. Oh, let me talk about the interference for just a second. So what, what's happened? They got those arms two and a half miles long. And so you take a laser beam. So the physics students all know how this works. Take the laser beam, and a laser has a very special kind of light that it puts out. What's it called, guys? What kind of light does the laser put out? Coherent. So it puts out coherent light, which means it's the same wavelength, but it's also in phase. So it puts out this light. They then hit a half cylinder mirror, so it splits the beam. This goes down two and a half miles. This bounces up here, goes two and a half miles. They got mirrors at this end and this end. Those mirrors are 88 pounds. Why in the world do you need a mirror of 88 pounds to reflect a little laser light? They don't want anything interfering with the possibility of that light. And that might have been part of the problem before. I don't know. Now they weigh 88 pounds. There's also a very special mechanism for suspending those mirrors. They don't want any ground shaking or anything to affect it. The only thing they want to affect this is gravity waves. So it bounces off of these 88 pound mirrors, comes back here, comes back here, goes through here, bounces up here, goes through, goes to a screen here, and it causes it, what kind of pattern? Interference pattern, causes an interference pattern. But remember, this is infrared light, they can't even see it. But of course, the receptors can, can see it. Uh, and that interference pattern should basically just stay stationary. It should just keep looking like it looks. And that's how it did for like, you know, 10 years. <laughs> but then finally, September the 14th uh, of 2015, now I can go back to a slide. They saw these squiggles. <laughs> so Livingston Hanford, notice the squiggles. Very, very, very similar. And from those little squiggles, In 2017, Kim Thorne, Renee, Rainier Weiss, and Barry Barish won the Nobel Prize in Physics for those little squiggles. Now, this part is way over my head. I don't understand how they did this, but from those little squiggles, they were able to determine that what occurred was two black holes merged. Okay, one black hole was 29 times the mass of the sun. The other black hole was 36 times the mass of the sun. They were going around and around and around. And what happens when a charged particle accelerates? What does it do? It gives off electromagnetic radiation, right? When very massive objects accelerate, and when you're going in circular motion, you're accelerating, it gives off gravity waves, all right? But these are pretty low energy gravity waves when they're going around, okay? So they're going around, they're giving off energy. So what happens if you're in orbit and you give off energy? The orbit starts collapsing, goes down and down and down on itself. So these things are getting closer and closer and closer together until, bam, the two black holes, 29 times the mass of the sun, 36 times the mass of the sun collide, and they form one giant black hole, 62 times the mass of the sun. Any mathematicians out there? What's wrong with my math? 29 plus 36 is 65. We now have a black hole 62 times the mass of the sun. Three times the mass of the sun was converted into energy in a split second. And not electromagnetic energy, gravity wave energy. What do gravity waves do? Gravity waves expand and contract space-time. 
if we had been there, or if we'd have been a hundred light years away, probably been ripped to shreds. Fortunately, again from these squiggles, how did they know this? Please don't ask me. <laughs> 1.2 billion light years away. 1.2 billion light years away is what they calculated where these stars were when they formed. So I told that story to my class in 2016, so it'd been fall of 2016, and one of my students says, you know, those black holes getting closer and closer and emerging like that, it's kind of like when, when you meet Jesus. You start studying the Bible, you start praying, you talk to people, you get closer and closer and closer, and you know, bam, you make that decision and accept him as your savior. And the universe changes because the soul has been saved. And the God of the universe smiles because he has another child. Thank you. <laughs>